unlocking it. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> And I'm going to do a quick pulse, but we'll go ahead and uh, do an intro. Um, it's kind of interesting. I'm doing a panel of, and I'm leading the panel, but I know stuff about what you guys are talking about. And last year, I um, had the privilege of moderating women filmmakers, of which I know absolutely nothing. <laughs> so I felt, <laughs> I felt a bit intimidated, but it was an amazing, amazing panel of women. So thank you all for coming. Um, again, this is. Um, I'll do a quick pulse on the room uh, once we get going, but we'll go ahead and just let these um, experts introduce themselves. So I um, am with uh, Ticket Force. We do um, web-based ticketing solutions all across many markets, including um, festivals. Obviously, that's why I'm here. And we have three people here representing three different ticketing platforms, plus one who is one of you um, sitting in the middle of the sharks here. So. Uh, John, start with just a brief intro. Sure, John Riccardi, uh, I'm a senior strategic account manager at Eventbrite. We sell two to three million tickets a week for all manners of events, uh, including some you might know like Bottle Rock, Newport Folk Festival, Tribeca Film Festival. I'm Cassie Condor. I manage the festival success team at Ticketfly. Uh, similarly, primary ticketing provider servicing all different uh, verticals. Uh, my name is David Bernal. I have uh, two food and wine festivals, Pebble Beach Food and Wine and Los Angeles Food and Wine Festival. And we sell tickets. <laughs> I'm Willie Litvak. I'm the founder of Squad Up. Uh, Squad Up is a mobile-first ticketing, event management, and audience engagement platform. Um, the crux of our value pro proposition lies in a completely white-labeled implementation for enterprise customers. Um, we've been doing it for about four and a half years. It's been tremendously fun. We have a little over 600 customers now. Uh, and they range tremendously. We do the New York City Wine and Food Festival all the way down to uh, self-service, um, smaller events for kind of amateur event organizers as well. Amateur yeah, event organizers. Just a quick sound check. Is there anybody that you could not hear? Can you hear everybody? Good? It's all good? If you don't mind in the audience, there's so much we can talk about in ticketing um, and a lot of angles we can go. And you've got a lot of experts here on this on the stage. So if there is something that you really want to make sure we touch on today, do you mind just shouting it out? Be bold. Go ahead. Scalping. Scalping. See, we did not have that on the agenda. No. All right. What else? All VIP. things. What? VIP. VIP. Okay, anything else that comes to mind? Okay. All right, well, by way of uh, introduction, those are two tough topics that we didn't, you know, even really touch on. <laughs> um, I think by way of intro, um, there is a lot of range of need in ticketing, and when you ticket a festival, you really can start, as, as some of you know, you could sell roll tickets with a cash drawer if that's what worked for you, and you had a really small festival, and, and, and that worked. Um, obviously, there's going to be challenges to that, all the way up from everything completely automated with wristbands and, and super fancy technology when you've got 100,000 people at a festival. Uh, most of us in this room probably fit somewhere in between those two scenarios. And so what we would love to offer to you is how do you know uh, what's important, what's most important to you uh, when you choose your ticketing partner and when you look at platforms and who really does the right thing and, and how do we make some of those choices. Um, so I'll just kind of open it up to this group here from your experience in working with um, festival clients in particular, uh, what are some of the key things that you think they should be looking at when they're looking? And we're gonna try really hard to um, keep it brand neutral so that we're not sitting here kind of giving you a product pitch, but we're talking in generalities about um, what types of things you should look for uh, in a platform. Jump in. Let's do it. Uh, I have the benefit of, of not only being at Eventbrite now, but I, I've been a festival producer and uh, worked on a number of festivals here in North America. And uh, my kind of experience from both speaking to our partners and also my personal experience is that you always want to start when it comes to ticketing with the ease of the purchase. 
Um, and it sounds like something so obvious and so basic, but you would not believe how many people are looking at ticketing providers who don't actually go and try to purchase a ticket on those platforms before they make a decision. So in point of fact, if you're doing a food and wine festival, you might want to look at food and wine festivals that are available on different ticketing platforms and try out that purchase flow. Is it short? Is it, is it two screens and you're done? Is it long? Does it ask for too much information? Does it require creating a login for an account that you have to then go back in and use when you make a purchase? These are all things you want to consider because at the end of the day, you're in the, the customer business, your customer, and you want to make their experience great. So it starts with ticketing. Oftentimes, that's the first touch point. Mm -hmm. And that experience should be a positive experience relative to your festival and what it is that you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, and we talked about this um, backstage a little bit, but I think all event organizers and all of you in the audience will agree with this, um, require endless permutations and combinations from their ticketing platforms. Um, you also are aware, because I'm sure you get hundreds of sales emails every year from ticketing companies, um, that there are, is always a shiny new object, whether it's like some type of promoter tracking or discounts for social sharing. Um, and a lot of times these features are actually quite small. Um, but what they function as is like this shiny new object where somebody who, you know, you may be with Eventbrite or Ticketmaster and very comfortable with the feature set they have. Um, and then this startup comes around with this kind of shiny feature and you think to yourself like, oh, I really need that, like I'm switching. Uh, and then you switch and realize that everything that you use to manage your festival has disappeared because there's all these kind of what normal people may call mundane ticketing features um, that are just so important. You know, everything from like, and this sounds again very mundane, but like, how you can manage your tickets and how you pro how, where your fees are. Do you have all-in pricing? Do you have the option of pushing the fees onto the customer? What do your promo codes look like? So this really, really small stuff that I think a lot of customers take for granted um, because they're chasing the, new, the, the newest and the latest and the greatest. So I think what's really important when you're making your decision is understanding, hey, if I'm going to go for something new, let's make sure they have everything that I'm used to already um, before I jump into something brand new just because of one small feature. There are probably something like over a hundred ticketing platforms. So there's six. There are six hundred. You just ruined companies. my day. But yeah. you know, there might even if you narrow that down to legitimate companies that have functional products, you're at at least thirty. And there's not very many um, things that you have that much choice in. And it, you don't even have 30 kinds of peanut butter at the store, right? That's just exhausting to even consider. There's 45 ticketing companies here, so. There's how many? Okay. Yeah, right? I know. So those 15 people feel bad, right? Now. Yes, exactly. And, and so, you know, the range of choice really in our industry makes it kind of a mess. And, it, and, and as to your point, one thing that we assume sometimes is that everything is going to work. They're going to have the basics covered. So they're going to look at that and they're going to go, all 600, 130 companies, 10, however many I look out, you, most people start and you, you assume the checkout's going to be easy, the web process is going to be easy, it's just ticketing, it's not that big of a deal, my door sales are going to work really well, it's a quick checkout for at the event, and you make that assumption and then you choose by shiny objects. And I think what we're saying is flip that a little bit and start with the basics. And sadly to say, there are a lot of companies out there that don't have the basics down. And, and so how do we determine that, Cassie, if you're looking at... You know, how do I how do I really test and know that this these three providers I'm looking at are not going to fail me on the day of my event, or they're going to have a good process? Yeah, absolutely. I think you need to do your research. Um, so, like John mentioned, go through the purchase flow and make sure that you know what it's going to look like from a consumer perspective. Um, reputable ticketing companies should also be able to provide you with um, referrals. So you should be able to talk to other. Uh, clients who are currently using the platform and, and get their perspective on the pros and the cons and what's working and what's not. I think a lot of times in the RFP process, we kind of go through this laundry list of products and features that a ticketing provider can give. And I think it, it gets to be a little bit overwhelming, I think. Um, and some of the shiny objects, um, you know, can, can kind of sway. 
Um, but I think there's a bit of a firestorm that starts immediately following that, and that's usually immediately getting the event up on sale and kind of just getting the ball rolling. And so um, I think attention kind of diverts to uh, the nuts and bolts and, and getting this going and making it happen. Um, and what you need to remember to do is circle back on those features. Um, what we find is that a lot of clients don't actually take advantage of the full feature set. Um, so you want to make sure that you have a partner that's going to work with you and kind of monitor that for you and circle back with you and say, um, you know, hey, we've noticed that you haven't been taking advantage of this. This could really benefit your sales. Well, look at both of your job titles. Um, I don't, say them again. What is yours? Uh, senior strategic account manager. A strategic account manager in your manager of festival success. All right. So, I mean, you know, five years ago, three years ago, ticketing companies didn't have, you know, cl client, they were client service reps, but they weren't people that were, you guys are making sure people use your product correctly. And that is something that, it, that has come out of the fact that we're all looking here going, we're building stuff, people aren't using it. In the end, it's a transactional deal and they want to buy tickets and sell tickets, and to, to get those tools really in place and used takes some partnership. Yeah, I would, I would just kind of be even more crisp on what we've just talked about here. When you're looking at a ticketing provider, uh, are you looking at the platform as you should, and we talked about, but also what's the customer service going to be like? Uh, once you sign on, hmm. is there going to be someone on the other end of the phone who is that going to be? Are they going to be overseas? Is it more than one person? Uh, do you have 24-7 access? Because most of us are building events that take place at night or on the weekend. And uh, most people who are in the workforce in the United States don't work at night and on the weekend. Uh, these are questions you need yourself. to ask. Well, <laughs> I'm, listen, I've seen you at plenty of events, the same ones. Uh, and it's again, it seems like such a basic thing. But ask, you know, what is the customer service that I'm going to get if I choose to sign on with your platform? Who are the people I'm going to be working with? What is their experience? Are they working with a thousand other partners or are they only going to work with a dozen? And, and understand that profile when you're making that decision. I would echo that as well. I think that's very important. Um, to kind of add on to that, I would also um, recommend you know, taking a look at the client support as well. Very important what your fan is going to see and how they're going to be treated. But equally important is how you're going to be treated um, when you're dealing with a ticketing provider. So along the same lines, same questions. Um, who's going to be supporting you? When are they available? Um, how readily accessible is that support? Think about things like on-site support. Do you need someone on-site uh, with you when your event is happening? How many people do you need? Uh, what are their responsibilities while they're on site? So all of these things are, are things to consider, um, you know, not just the fan experience, but your own experience as well. And on, the, on the festival side, our, we, we ended up uh, building our own ticketing platform because we started 10 years ago. And I think that like ticketing software and platforms, obviously there's a lot that's grown over that time. And so functionality, especially at that time, um, wasn't such that you could have, uh, let's say, permutations for a single customer across numerous days where everyone could buy different things at different levels and select a lot of different things that would all be in one singular ticket. And so that technology obviously has is, is very much there now, but I, I think the, the point I wanted to make is that with all of the options you have, if you are throwing a party, for us, what was most important was the consumer experience and how, um, like I didn't want to, sorry if Ticketmaster's in the room, I just didn't want... <laughs> my guests to leave our web page to go someplace else to a whole other world to transact. Um, and I didn't want to also change our, our ex user experience because we could have, left, let's say they're going to 14 events in the weekend, could we have changed that model where they buy 14 tickets and we send them 14 individual tickets? Yeah, but that to me didn't sound like a great customer experience. I wanted a singular pass that would allow for, for our guests to enjoy whatever it was that they selected. And so I think whatever, um, because we're in an experiential business, right? So I, I think the key for anybody that's throwing parties out there is w working with your ticket part ticketing partner to um, deliver a product that's exactly what you want to sell to your consumer. And don't change what you wanted to do because there's only a singular solution there because there's so much great technology out there that these guys can pretty much accomplish anything today, especially if you're starting now. Um, but make sure that you don't change what you wanted the experience to be, because at the end of the day, that's what we're selling, right? Whether it's a music festival, film festival, food wine festival, um, that ticketing moment is the first uh, impression your, your, your guests have. The online transaction, 
And then the first thing that they do when they show up is have to show their ticket or some sort of access um, to get into this thing you've been planning all year long to throw. So I think it's an extremely important um, mm -hmm. part of your customer relationship. Um, but again, like I said, I would no matter what you do, think, think of the consumer first because that's the person that's giving you money. <laughs> Yeah, it's our job to give you guys money. <laughs> <laughs> also, I mean, I think it's important when you go out to do your RFP to understand what you're looking for. Um, all ticketing platforms have their own nuanced pieces of functionality. And I think there are kind of really easy starting blocks for you. Like, um, do you want to use a shopping cart or not? Um, and that really quickly will knock down your, your available vendors to you know, half of what you started with. So um, I think going in, like any process, when you go in to buy a car, you know what you want to buy, you know what you're looking for, how much you want to pay. Um, and I think a lot of ticketing, a lot of people who go out for ticketing just kind of say like, hey, we, we need a ticketing company, let's bring them all in, they'll give us our, their, their best pitch and then we'll make a decision. It's helpful to like have that pre-strategy conversation with your team internally and to say like, hey, what has worked for us in the past? What do we definitely need to hold on to? Where would we like to see improvement? And what are kind of the key features around like, can we use our own merchant account? Do we have to use the customer's merchant or the, the ticketing company's merchant account? Do they have all-in pricing? Can we manipulate the processing fees? Um, how do we think about? How does this company think about rebates? How do we want to use rebates in our to our advantage? Um, so I think it's important to have that kind of internal strategy session before you even start your RFP process. And I think that sounds very self-explanatory, but. Um, I'm always surprised with the amount of uh, potential customers who come to us like, yeah, we're, we're talking to 15 ticketing companies and like just send us your proposal and uh, we're gonna review once we have you know, the proposals narrowed down. <laughs> and it's like, that doesn't make any sense at all. Um, so yeah, I think you know, the planning portion is important. We're curious a little bit too, and, and this may not be representative you know, of, the, of the whole world here in this audience, but how many of you have had multiple ticketing platforms where, you know, with your festival where you tend to have, you, you know, maybe you've used two or three different platforms because you use one one year and it doesn't do everything you want it to do or they have a fail or it's not as awesome as you thought and so then you switch to another one the next year and another one. How many of, would you say we've used multiple platforms as opposed to we have a long-term partner? in the room. You can raise them high. <laughs> That's typically what we see, and I think there's an advantage to having kind of a long-term plan. Um, John, what were you going to say about that? Well, I was just going to ask, how many people in the room are producing their first event and, and haven't used the platform before at all and are kind of in that process of figuring it out? Good question. A couple. Yeah. More than a couple. Okay. Are you overwhelmed with your choices? No. Good. Well, <laughs> wouldn't it be fun if we had all 600 of us up here on the, <laughs> or even all 30 or 15 or whatever? Um, you know, somebody did mention merchant account, and there are different approaches to that. There are um, advantages and disadvantages. Um, to who holds the funds until that event happens. Um, and we probably have a difference of opinion up here um, based on what I know some of the platforms do. Um, so I'll give you guys a chance to have to, to be a proponent for one way or the other. Um, what are the advantages to the ticket company holding the funds versus um, until that event happens versus you being responsible as the festival and getting the funds in as they come in? Uh, to me, I would say it's really um, a, a choice for each individual client or each individual event organizer. Um, <clears throat> there are pros and cons to both, but I think it's really how involved with that process you want to be. Um, mm -hmm. So being on your own merchant account allows you a little bit more flexibility with the funds and, and receiving the money, um, but it also uh, includes some responsibility. And so you're going to be in charge of uh, things like handling the chargebacks that come through, um, you know, refund requests, partial refund requests. All of these things are things that you have to be prepared to handle. So that's the benefit of using a provider's uh, merchant account is that a lot of times the ticketing provider will provide those services for you. Um, but then again, it it's really just depends uh, on how involved you want to be in that process process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in the case of the Fire Festival, what just happened, um, I don't know. Who they, were was... not, they were not using their own merchant account, and they were using a ticketing company that was ticketing their first festival. Wow. Oh, that was, yeah, great. Little, little, yes. uh, little yeah. dangerous. Yeah, 
but that's a good example. If something does happen and you have a major artist not show up or you have something that, you know, you have massive rain outs or whatever happens, um, if you have spent those funds uh, on marketing or whatever and you, you don't have them in an escrow account, I think that's what Cassie's touching on a little bit, is you're at tremendous risk um, by doing that. So it's a matter of knowing not um, what you're getting into by using your own merchant account and the daily reconciliations, those types of things. Yeah, but I, I mean, I, I just have to say, I, I have no idea why you'd ever let someone else have your money. Uh, because throwing a festival, you are going to, you're, you're at risk anyways. You're, if you're, if you're, are going to spend money, and let, maybe you have 50 million in the bank and you're just mm -hmm. like, I'm just borrowing against my own bank account. Right. I, but if you're in the business of, ma of making a festival happen, cash flow is critical. Mm -hmm. Like it is everything. So. I mean, um, I have been, when we started, like to the point of a day, like I wouldn't let a ticketing company even hold my funds over for a single day. So I wanted 100% control of my funds because why would you give that control to somebody else? I mean, you guys might have a really good argument for this, but you know, from my perspective, like that is your lifeblood as a business is your cash flow. Yeah. And you need it to operate and pay employees and market and promote. And if it's somewhere else, you, you don't have that flexibility. Mm -hmm. As a ticketing company, I would prefer if everybody was on their own merchant account. It makes life a billion times easier for us. We don't have to settle. We don't have to handle chargebacks on your behalf. It's just way easier from the ticketing company's perspective. When you're in, specifically in, in like electronic dance music, um, there is a lot of fraud and there are a lot of chargebacks and the organizers or festival producers are just not necessarily set up to manage or dispute those chargebacks on a regular basis. So what you get from using the company's ticketing uh, merchant account um, is that they're gonna handle those chargebacks for you. That's really the big thing in my opinion. Chargebacks are like a huge pain you know, someone with an Amex can call five months after the festival and say, I don't recognize this charge. And before you know it, that money's going to be out of your account. It's going to take you 90 days to dispute it and get it back. Um, so in the beer, food, wine space, especially with, with your clientele and it's much higher priced tickets, they're probably less likely to charge it back. Um, but when you have like $50 to $125 single day tickets to an EDM festival where the demographic is 24 and down to like 14 using their parents' credit cards, their, the chargeback incidents becomes much more extreme. So it's about understanding what you need. And, and to David's point, um, if you require cash flow, there's simply nothing better than using your own merchant account and getting every credit card swipe, the money goes right into your account. Uh, most ticketing companies will do rolling settlement anyway, though. If you do use their merchant account, they may hold back like 10 to 30% of the funds, uh, but they'll settle with you on like a weekly or biweekly basis if you do require the money. Uh, they may like ask you to like fill out like a credit card authorization or something of that nature or guarantee that, you know, if the festival collapses, you're going to, you're going to reimburse them. But um, those are kind of your, your two options. Like, do you want cash flow, do you want cash flow to manage your event or do you want to outsource the chargeback management? And uh, to add to that, again, I'm, I'm enjoying stating the obvious, but I'm going to state the obvious. <laughs> uh, staffing. So for you to, mm -hmm. to handle everything on your own merchant account, you certainly have people who are looking at your books every day, uh, doing the reconciliation. Ideally, you don't have any weather situations or something where you have to do massive refunds across the whole entire event. If you have chargebacks, somebody actually has to sit and process all of that. So for a smaller shop who's doing their first event, and maybe it's uh, you know, not this huge, large scale, uh, type, it might be easier for you in terms of manpower to have someone else handle it. Um, for us, we actually started as a payment processing and uh, anti-fraud company. That's, that's the core of Eventbrite. That's the backbone. Uh, but we handle, if you want to use your own merchant account, we'll let you do it because at the end of the day, like Cassie said, it's your business. You know it's right for you. If you need that cash flow and you're staffed and ably prepared to deal with the refunds and chargebacks, that's that much more money you have on hand for your day to day. Uh, if you don't and you just think it's a good idea to have all that money on hand and then you have a weather situation or an incident or something along those lines, your life just got incredibly complicated and those problems can drag on for months. So it's really just more about strategically looking at your event. I think everybody in the room who's an event producer probably knows you plan for the worst. You don't plan for the best. You plan for the worst, and you build your event from there. If you do that, then you're going to be fine. You're going to make the right decision regardless. 
Yeah, and most, if not all, well, I wouldn't say that. Many ticketing companies, especially in this space, offer you the choice of, of using your own merchant account. Well, we just like you to think about, obviously, David, the cash flow, and you've got the staffing, that's great. You get in, especially if it was a first year festival, if you look at it from a consumer point of view, do they trust you to deliver on that festival as we just saw? Um, a big massive failure. So if you're a consumer and you're going to a first year festival and you know, you're buying directly from them, you have no protection as a consumer that that festival is going to happen, that they're, not, that they're going to be responsible with the funds and that, that there's, there's going to be a risk that your buyers are going to take that you're going to fail and the money's going to be gone and they're never going to get it back. And so that is one reason why people look to ticketing companies to say, you know, I think as the consumers, from their point of view, they would much rather have their money with the ticketing company. Or once a festival is established, and we know year, year after year, and I've got a relationship with you, and Pebble Beach Food Festival is not going anywhere, and we feel comfortable with that. But if you're newer on the newer end, and, and people see, you know, they might be looking for powered by Eventbrite or powered by something that they recognize, even if your brand is front and center, something that's assuring them that if your festival doesn't happen or happen the way they thought it would or something, that they've got some kind of recourse. Um, so that's just something to think about from the buyer point of view as, you, as you're first getting kind of fired up. So, um, so the question was brought up about scalping. And um, I don't typically think of that in, in this market, but it, it came up. So um, let's go ahead and talk about what kind of anti-scalping tools and things like that we should be looking for as um, people are looking for a ticketing platform. What can you do about it? <laughs> I mean, you guys obviously address this more. I, I think the, the topic goes back to what I kind of want to ask you guys anyways, is where the concept of ticketing is going anyways. Because when you mentioned, 600 there's 600 people in the business that was well I think there's a lot of there's a lot I think there's a lot more that are um, paralleling that that aren't billing themselves as ticketing companies uh, at, like Apple pay or things that are they're working technologies around your presence based on something or biometric companies or like a million because it's all about getting access to a place and then the, the, the second piece of what is a ticket is identifying what level of consumer you are at a festival so we can say who they are. Because if it was all digital, and it was a digital footprint you had, there would be no scalping because you couldn't, you couldn't do that. Um, Talk, which is a company that Nick Kokona started that started around, that's now doing restaurant res tickets for restaurants right. as opposed to, mm -hmm. so they're starting to sell tickets. It's a, you have to pay to transfer to Alinea or Next or Aviary if you're going to give your tickets. So I'm gonna say, hey man, I can't make it. Do you wanna take my Alinea reservation? They allow that, but then they take a fee for transfer. So that digital component, from, from a scalping standpoint, festivals would love it. Like, I'd love people to buy a ticket <laughs> and then pay me $25 every time they gave it to their friends. It would be outstanding. So I, I think that technology is going to start to solve some of these things because obviously the concept of a paper ticket is, kind of, is, is a dinosaur, even though it still yeah. has relevance. If we looked at tomorrow... I mean, and then that doesn't answer what do we do with scalping today, but I do want to talk a little bit about where you guys feel ticketing is going because I think it's changing so fast. Okay. It's interesting on scalping because it's like this problem that's been going on forever, and there was a really interesting article about LCD sound system where, like, they were upset about this 10 years ago, and it's still happening, and nothing's happening about it. Um, and candidly, I don't see anybody doing anything about it at all. Um, and it's, if anything, it's going to get worse now that secondary ticketing companies like SeatGeek and StubHub have gotten into primary. Um, to, da to David's point, you know, historically when you're reselling, you take like a physical ticket and resell it. But if you're buying your primary ticket on StubHub and there's a secondary ticket exchange right there, what's to stop a bot or a ticket agent to buy from buying a bunch of 76ers tickets and StubHub's doing the ticketing for 76ers and reselling those all on StubHub or doing it in the arena with somebody people want to see more than the 76ers. Um, but yeah, so I, I'm not positive that, and I know the question came from the back of the room, so that's where I'm pointing my eyes, but that uh, I, I don't see anybody doing anything about it. And I, if anything, I think it's getting worse. Um, it's not a problem that candidly smaller ticketing companies like us have to deal with. Uh, it's, it's, I, I bet Ticketfly sees this all the time because you guys have great artists and smaller venues that are that are that are happening all the time. So, would be curious like how you, how you how you think about it. Yeah, I actually <clears throat> think that it, it goes back to a question about the secondary market as a whole, 
um, and, and what we can do to kind of stop the scalping at that point. So secondary market, there's always going to be a need for the secondary market. I think the ideal use for it is, you know, <clears throat> to help those who change of plans, can no longer make the event, need mm -hmm. recourse to be able to offload the ticket and hopefully not lose money on the deal. Um, the problem is that the, uh, the environment that services those people is also um, you know, easily abused by scalpers. And so I think what we're starting to see is, I, I do think we're actually seeing some movement in this direction. Um, to me, I think the movement that needs to happen and is starting to happen is uh, more validation, verification, being able to actually validate that a ticket a ticket is legitimate. Um, and so I think we're starting to see more of that um, involvement from the primary ticketing providers because we're the ones with the data. We're the ones who can verify whether or not it's a legitimate ticket. So we're starting to see more primary providers um, getting into the secondary market because you know, at the crux of it, I think we're the only ones who can really say um, that this is a legitimate ticket. So we're seeing, I think we're seeing um, primary uh, ticketing companies um, either developing their own secondary products or partnering with um, other secondary uh, providers to kind of close that ecosystem. Um, along with that, uh, to the scalping point, um, I think we're seeing a, a little bit more, I guess, a trend towards fairness in the secondary market. So we're seeing um, some of these companies that are that are doing the uh, verified um, secondary market tickets, um, putting ceilings on yeah. on the prices for those tickets. So uh, there, I think there are some things happening, um, definitely. But I, I think the secondary market as a whole uh, needs you know needs some work as well. It's what a weird it? problem because the ticketing companies' incentives are not aligned with the ticket buyers. The ticketing companies want to generate as many processing fees as possible, which happens through selling as many tickets as possible. So by stopping people or creating fi friction in the funnel they're effectively hurting their bottom line or their top line and subsequently their bottom line. So it's, this is a solvable problem that people are not moving fast enough on because the, the incentives are not aligned. Can uh, I, I, have to, I have to add something that I, I think slightly disagrees with what you just okay. said. Maybe you were talking about the other 599 ticketing companies <laughs> out there. Uh, but you know, again, at Eventbrite we started as a payment processing and anti-fraud company uh, specific for credit cards. Our belief is that, you know, we don't do a lot of large scale events. We don't do, you know, the hugest festivals. We do some, and I mentioned a couple at the top, but we're primarily focused on smaller scale and, and middle scale events. And those generally don't have scalping or secondary ticketing issues. Um, if you really want to know about scalping, Google Charles Dickens book tour. You know, he came to the United States a couple hundred years ago and there were scalping tickets for that. I'm sure it goes back <laughs> to the Coliseum in Roman times as well. Right. Um, now that things are digital, it becomes a little bit easier for the bad guys to win. But at the same time, um, you know, in terms of what can be done, you know, when Newport went on sale, Newport Folk Festival went on sale, we actually slowed down transactions, and 10% of all tickets that were being purchased were able, through an algorithm and a matrix, to identify those people as known resellers and pull all of those tickets out of, out, of, out of transactions <laughs> and put them back into the hands of people who wanted to go. You guys must be venture-backed. Well, you know, <laughs> the, the point is this. You know, we talk a lot about scalping after it happens, when it, it hits the secondary market and people are paying exorbitant prices. And that's the kind of media point that everyone likes to focus on. But you can stop it before it happens. Right. And again, if we're talking about ticketing providers and picking a partner, ask, what are they doing? What are they doing in the purchase flow? What are they doing to identify known resellers? What are they doing to pull tickets out of cart and reassign them and allow those tickets to go to people who are your fans who want to come to the festival? One other thing I would add is, again, someone who's been a festival producer is, Talking about bots and, and secondary market people online and so forth is one thing. You guys also need to pay attention if you're using wristbands and so forth and, and you know, cash mm -hmm. box tickets and so forth, carny tickets. Uh, I've worked on festivals where there's just a half a dozen people hanging outside the gates where there are in and out privileges. Hey, you leaving for the day? I'll give you 150 bucks for that wristband. And then you turn around, hey, you going to the festival? This wristband works, I'll sell it to you for $300. So, Part of that operationally is incumbent upon you to police yourself and understand what's happening at your gates as well. The problem does not exist only online. That's true. Uh, and I don't know if the question, sometimes people ask this, the question about secondary or scalping, it also comes in fraud. Are you, so I don't know if that, that was the question, was what if you have just 
fraudulent tickets. So scalping is one thing. You've got people coming in and buying a large number of tickets like you guys were stopping and reselling them at a higher value. Then you also have the issue of just the full-on fraudulent tickets. So you've got people coming to your gate. The barcode doesn't work because you didn't issue the ticket. It's not real. They bought it on one of the sites when you Google. So I don't know if that's what the question was for, but it kind of fits into the same scenario as you know, fraud and scalping are two two issues that when you start getting your ticket prices that I would say 50 bucks and above, you know, if everything's 20 bucks, you're probably not going to have an issue. But when you when you start getting into the 50, 100, and then some of those multi hundred and even thousand dollar packages that you have, that's where the fraud and the scalping both really become an issue. So you can kind of worry less if you're at a lower threshold on your ticket price. And the fraudsters are creative. Like they, yeah. they are coming up with like, what we see, the most common fraud that we see on platform is people using stolen credit cards to buy tickets to real events and then selling the, st the tickets that were purchased with the stolen credit cards. So the person whose credit card it actually is gets protection from their credit card company. So the festival organizer gets a charge back. Right. Meanwhile, that QR code may have already been used at the event. If it's before the event, you can invalidate it and put it back into inventory. But if, it's, if the event has already happened, that person has already attended the festival with a ticket that was purchased using a stolen credit card. Um, and that's just, you know, I, th I think it, part of as technology continues to elevate, there is more and more tools for catching this type of fraud earlier on. Um, but as long as people want to steal and do this kind of stuff, like they're always get, probably going to be half a step ahead. Um, so it's just about, about uh, remaining vigilant and speaking to your ticketing company ahead of time and saying, hey, what are you guys doing to stop fraud? Um, how do you guys think about this? Is the, is the strategy evolving? What are you guys seeing? And, and I think that's part of having the open dialogue. One, one of the questions you can ask um, and that helps fight the fraud and the scalping is if the provider offers something called delayed delivery. So when you get into the digital, um, Obviously, if you're mailing out paper tickets, and sometimes we do because they're passes and they're really cool or they're, they're credentials, but we often don't mail those out until much closer to the event. But in the digital, when you're getting a mobile ticket or you're getting a print at home ticket, those typically with a lot of systems will go out immediately, and that's the problem. I bought it with a stolen card, um, and then I'm going to get the charge back, but now I've already got the barcode. So one question you can ask that's a really simple fix for that is delayed delivery on your digital deliveries, and that simply means that their moment of purchase happens, it gives the ticketing company time to go in and retract those orders if you want to that are obviously fraudulent or known, you know, there's a lot of tools in place. And then you deliver the print at homes or the mobile tickets in a delayed measure. So you set the time frame for later so that they're not, they'll get their confirmation email, but they don't have to get that barcode and put it out there into space where they can sell it and do things to it. And then all of a sudden the money's gone. So that's one tool that's, that's, fairly readily available that is a question that you can ask. Yeah, I would add to that there are steps that you can take as well on, on your own end as the event organizer um, that can help kind of thwart this type of activity, especially as you near uh, get closer to the event date. Um, you can start considering things like will call instead of print at home. You can think about things like uh, potentially lowering the ticket limits uh, that someone can buy per transaction. Specifically, I think this is most effective when you're talking about high dollar tickets. Um, you're generally not going to see someone buy uh, eight super VIP passes the day of the event. Um, so that's going to look a little bit suspicious. So you can, there are actions that you can take on your own end. Um, you do have to weigh the pros and cons. Obviously, moving towards will call is going to affect um, the workload and traffic for the box office, so definitely take those things into consideration. But if you're doing will call and you're um, asking for identification as well as the credit card used to make the purchase, that's going to significantly cut down on the amount of fraud orders that are allowed to enter. Mm -hmm. So hopefully we answer that question. We're getting close to, well, we may as well open up for questions anyway, because we've got about 10 minutes left. Um, so we touched on that a bit. We didn't touch. Does anybody have the specific question on VIP that you wanted to ask? Or any other questions for us? Yes. That's because John is not your account manager. Well, we'll see. We're going to find no. out. <laughs>
Well, I can, uh, I'll answer that in two parts. The first part is the piece of functionality you're talking about has actually recently been deprecated. And all of that now lives in the analytics sidebar link, which is on the left-hand side of your event page. And it's broken down, it's so a little more crisp in terms of what that is. But speaking generally, we provide, uh, and not to go into a marketing conversation because we're here to talk about ticketing, but we provide marketing channels of our own, including our website, our socials, et cetera, um, which have trackable links. And we're able to kind of monitor and point back to you where sales, both traffic and, traffic and conversions are coming from, from those channels so you can basically see uh, the added value of the marketing that you're getting on top of what your normal uh, kind of marketing direction is. And if you want to see more about that, um, talk to me after, and I can kind of show you the new setup and everything. Any other questions? Well, we covered a lot of the basics. And David, I know you said, hey, uh, I, I want to talk question. about what's coming up yeah, and what well, direction I mean, is I'd, ticketing I'd like to going. hear from you guys. So we've gone from paper tickets, you know, dinosaurs, but still getting used, Yeah. to I mean, all sorts of things now where, you know, Amazon's launching stores where you just walk in, buy stuff, and walk out, and they charge you. You don't even have to, you know. So <laughs> thinking about those kind of technologies, mm -hmm. where, where is ticketing going? Like, what does a ticket mean tomorrow? Like, where do biometrics fit into this? Why do we even need it if we can utilize a digital footprint or something personal to us? So, like, fast forward, where, where do you guys see this entire process going? Because I think we have all of these different... Um, platforms that are doing interesting pieces, RFID, beacon technology to our phone, um, ticketing platform that, that has its own functionality. But they all, they're all sort of working in sort of parallels that have to do with access, purchasing, um, and experience, right? So mm -hmm. that's it. Where, like, what, what's, what's, where do you guys see tomorrow for ticketing? Or credentialing, or, uh, you know, is it gonna, it's not going to look the same. Yeah. So I think you got to start with the top down to answer this question. So we've like thrown the number around 600 ticketing companies. I think that's pretty accurate. But if you were to look at this from this top down perspective, about 50% of the market is controlled by Ticketmaster. The other 599 co co uh, companies compete for the remaining portion of the market. Um, so what's happened is there's that like screams commodity software product. And with any commoditized prof, uh, product, you're going to get margin compression, compression. Or in our industry, we call our margin our processing fee. So processing fees have become compressed to the point where if you don't have tremendous scale, like uh, obviously Eventbrite and Ticketfly have been able to achieve that. But if you don't have tremendous scale, it's very challenging to, to, to build a meaningful business. So I think where ticketing is going, at least from a business model perspective, is away from processing fees. Um, not anytime soon. Uh, but I do believe that there is an amazing opportunity with whether it's in-app engagement or digital brand activation, um, that at some point an upstart ticketing company is going to have both feature parity and reinvent the business model, uh, subsequently disrupting, to use a buzzword, disrupting the basis of competition in the industry, which for the last decade has been price or in our industry parlance processing fees. So I think that's... In my opinion, I think that's where ticketing is going. I think that's the 15 to 20 year uh, horizon for ticketing is that it's not going to be a processing fee based model anymore. Uh, and the first ticketing company that figures out how to make money away from processing fees and either goes to zero or shares a portion of that uh, additional revenue with the event organizer is gonna change the space entirely um, or change 50% of the space. Um, Ticketmaster will always be a processing fee business, uh, and you're not going to shake those venues that are that are owned and operated. So. I'm laughing because years ago, when I my husband's here, and we founded our company together, and it, we were not in it for very long. When he said, "I don't know, but I think it's going to go to where there's no fees," but he said this, you know, 13 years ago, and and so I don't know how how we would function without some sort of fees or charges on there. I mean, ticketing at its basics is credentialing. You, and you're just validating. Do I have the right to attend this event? Did I pay? Is it me? So how you transmit that information, barcode, scan, RFID, doesn't really matter, right? There's a, it could be a thing on your forehead. There's got to be something that attaches you to your purchase and how we credential people. So the format, basically, is all that really changes, whether it goes to a band, a credential badge, something on your head, I don't know, it's an implant in your wrist, but somehow we still have to validate. The whole thing is I bought a ticket here and I'm gonna attend an event here 
and and am I allowed to come in? And it's it's no it's really very similar to um, the airline industry, and I've always compared us to the airline industry. They've always been ahead of us. They had online seat selection long before we did, and it took it took the ticketing right, industry. Right, but now they make most of their profits selling miles to credit card companies. They do. They've but changed they, their business model. They're still credentialing, and right, they're just so building their, their fees in, right? So they had mobile tickets long before we had mobile tickets. Um, and so I, nobody gets a paper ticket anymore from the airline, really, unless you go to the kiosk because you, you're afraid your phone is going to die or something. So, I mean, it's still the same idea. So I think where it's going, um, you know, I'd like to hear from, from you two where you think it's, it's changing, but that's it at the basics for me is it's still, it's still got to credential you and say, yeah, you bought that ticket, you have a right to attend this event somehow. Yeah, I was going to say, as far as the future of technology, I think it's tough to predict. There are so many options and so many different ways this could go. Um, <clears throat> it, I think we'll just have to wait and see what the next step is. Uh, right now, it's obviously RFID, but that's continuing to grow and evolve. So, um, you know, I think it'll be interesting to see where that goes next. What that means to me in terms of, you know, being a primary ticketing provider is I actually think that um, we'll see more um, partnering and uh, not necessarily outsourcing, but, but having those integrated partnerships with the technology providers. Mm -hmm. um, some of the technology is just so um, intricate and intense and, and so dev heavy um, that I'm not sure it behooves a primary ticketing provider to really get that deep into it. And so instead, you know, I think the ability to partner with the best in the biz uh, leaves the ticketing provider uh, more agile and more able to adapt to Are you talking to about like other products like like the you know beverage and point of sale like and an app store. those kind of things like that's what you're talking about has yeah. like an app store i think this is like a perfect we were speaking about this earlier but i right. think this is a perfect segue for that yeah well cassie i don't think you were done were you no, done no. uh yeah i think a couple of things are happening now to to speak to to your point uh, one thing i want to do is touch on rfid rfid has been very topical for let's say the last five years in our business but it's an ancient technology it was invented during world war ii it was <laughs> only <true>. recently <laughs> when event producers and you know first retail and then event producers said hey here's this technology we can use for validation for access control right uh, and now we're seeing it for payments and things like that so to say we can look in the future and we have a crystal ball and we know what it's going to be, trust me, there was not a guy in 1940, whatever, who invented RFID and said, someday, festivals. Um, so what we need to do is keep an eye on what's happening now, what's emerging now. What we're seeing is distributed commerce, which is right. um, something we probably don't have enough time to get deep into. But basically the idea that there's not one exclusive place to get a ticket that's going to allow you to attend an event. Um, you're reading every day about tickets being available now at Costco or Walmart. Uh, with Eventbrite, we have a number of distributed commerce partners, Facebook being one of them, where you can purchase a ticket right within your newsfeed and never touch the Eventbrite page. These things are happening today. Um, relative to what Willie was saying about our, our kind of app store, um, we have 170 partners that we work with, and these are all best-in-class partners. They have functionality that we're not going to build ourselves. Um, like Cassie was saying, there's a lot of development work that goes into building a technology platform. We're not going to build a CRM solution tomorrow that's better than Salesforce, but we'll partner with Salesforce. Mm -hmm. And so again, it's this whole idea as a technology company, you want openness. It doesn't matter if we're talking about a ride sharing program or a ticketing provider or whatever, because no one company can cover it all. So we're going to work together. We're going to find ways to sell tickets where all of our fans live. Uh, we're not going to try and beat them over the head and make them come to us because we see that only works so well. And we're going to work with best-in-class partners who can accomplish that for us, and we're going to partner with them. And the net effect should be that more eyeballs are going to see your tickets because your tickets live where your fans live. And the provider of that ticket, the person servicing that ticket and putting it in front of them for purchase, probably is not going to be the majority of the time an Eventbrite or Ticketfly or Squad Up or Ticket Force. So if we, if we talk about three minutes in the future, I think it looks like that. Uh, if we talk about 10 years in the future, 15 years, I think we don't know. Again, who, who knew RFID would be such a big deal? We all would have bought stock. That's true. <laughs> That's a good ending point. Thanks. Any final questions? It looks like it's 2.20. Time to, Stuart, are you popping up here? Uh, or no? I'm, all right. One final question? Great. Thank you very much. We answered everyone's questions. Wow. Thank you so much. Great job, panel. <laughs>